Hey, <clears throat> Rylan here at the Vic Shop. A lot of people come to me and say, "Hey, I've just bought this cross country, or I've just bought this Victory, uh, and I've had it for a season or a few months or quite a long time, and no one's really taken a look at it. And I want you to give it a once over and give it your magic, because you're the professional, and <laughs> you know it. And, uh, and there's really nothing wrong. I just want a good set of eyes on it." Uh, I get that call a lot and there's really nothing magical or particularly professional about it. Uh, it's pretty simple stuff that I'm going to explain here what exactly I'm doing because I don't really even work on that kind of stuff anymore because if it's running good you ought to be able to maintain the bike. It doesn't need much. It's pretty simple stuff and it, then it gives me more time to deal with big issues that are kind of beyond just what your average guy in his garage can do and and so here is the video of the magic that I perform when I'm looking over a bike in, in this case it's a cross country with about 30,000 miles on it uh, I don't know anything about this bike it just uh, neither does the customer he just picked it up a while back and uh, everything's going fine with it but we just want to look it over and make sure that it's continue that's going to continue to run great and be reliable so, uh, so that is um, the purpose of the video today I'm going to talk about the suspension front and rear I'm going to talk about the brakes we're going to inspect the brakes we're going to pop the spark plugs out take a look at them the air filter the cables uh, the engine oil uh, let's see, yeah, no, we're going to look up at the idle air valve hoses. I mean, some of this was covered on a video that I made a decade ago, but uh, that was a decade ago. And so let's take another look at what I'm looking for on any used Victory, but in this case, it's a cross country. Check it out. So the best way to <clears throat> start looking a bike over is to be able to get it in the air and I of course am using a big professional table uh, but you can achieve the same results with a smaller jack at, at home and you can absolutely and should absolutely lift from the engine it's a solid member of the frame nothing wrong with lifting from the engine uh, and this is a great way to get the bike in the air and really get a good feel for uh, for what's going on and we'll just start with the front. The only uh, tool I'm going to be using for the front end is my little pen light. And I'm just going to start by checking out the wheel and tire. It spins freely. I can hear the brake discs kind of doing their thing. This uh, bike's going to need a front tire. Uh, it's down to the wear bars, so no big deal. Got it in the air. I'm going to do some other service. We'll put a tire on it. Uh, next thing I'm going to check is the brakes. Now the stock pads, they ought to go 40, 50, 60, 70,000 miles, no problem, I've seen that happen. Uh, and when the time comes to replace them, I do recommend you use the stock pads. Um, the stock pads have little grooves in them, let's see if we can zoom in on that. <clears throat> yeah, so you can see the grooves and the stock pads, and once we can no longer see those grooves, then we know that the pad is kind of down to the end of its life. But taking a look here, there's plenty of uh, wear groove left. These are only about at 50% or so. No problem. I just want to check all four of them in and out, left and right. Make sure they're not wearing weird, but I don't have any worries here. Next thing is the uh, forks themselves. The fork oil, routine maintenance is fork oil every 20,000. I've got a separate video on how to do fork oil. It's just replacing the oil. There's no need to do seals at any sort of regular interval unless they're leaking. It's like your engine has a bunch of seals, but we don't go through and replace all your engine seals if they're not leaking. <laughs> Same with the fork seals. A lot of guys say, I want you to put new oil and seals in it. Well, the seals aren't leaking we don't need to replace them so same with this bike both sides are dry we just replace the oil and keep on rocking i mean the stock seals can go 100,000 miles as long as you don't catch a rock or a weird bug and you're keeping up with the fluid changes so uh this one's dry just going to do a fork oil service on this when the time comes 
And then it's in the air. This is a great time to check out the steering head bearing. The steering head bearing is the two bearings that allow you to steer. And somewhere in the 40, 50, 60, 70,000 mile range, they're going to get a notch in them. The bearing's going to wear out. And then they need to be replaced, which is a big job. Um, and so I start checking for it about 30,000, get it up in the air. And what you're going to feel is that there'll be a notch in its straight vertical, or its straight up position as you're cruising down the road. And when you uh, tilt the steering left to right, you'll feel a distinct clink in, in the movement, and it'll kind of settle naturally into its straight up and down. This one feels great. I don't have any concerns about this one at all. It's smooth. There's no notch. Um, we're going to let it ride. We'll check it again in 20,000 when we do the fork oil again. And that's really it. You want to check the steering head bearing, both the pads in the front, check both the forks for leaking and, you know, the tires and, and just give it a good common sense overall evaluation. You know, if you, if you find a big rock sticking in there, you know, pull the rock out, <laughs> stuff like that. Uh, shake the rotors, maybe make sure that they're still, there's uh, no move, no huge movement in the floating rotors. And then uh, we can move on to the rear. Let's, uh, since we're looking at suspension, tires, and brakes and stuff, we'll move to the rear and check its suspension, tires, and brakes. <laughs> okay, rear side, same as the front. Let's start with the shock. The stock shock, um, sometimes it can get a leak, and there will be oil all over the clevis here, and then the shock needs replaced. So this one looks nice and dry. Um, also looking at the low or the link. There's a link on uh, the one side and shock on the other. This one, uh, the guys put an aftermarket link in it, and uh, the top bushing on it went dry, which gives a suspension squeak. And so on this bike, um, I'm gonna take it apart, and we're gonna fix that that bushing. Uh, but the squeak was what gave it away and uh, normally I wouldn't take it all apart just for uh, Just to check it all I guess unless the customer asked me to <laughs> uh, But that's that's really the extent of the um, The rear shock is just making sure it's not leaking. There's not much to that uh, And then same as the front. I just kind of spin it make sure there's no weird noises or anything and no excessive movement the one and only wheel bearing that i ever see go bad is the right hand side the pulley side of the rear uh, and i should have kind of hit on this on the front is that the wheel bearings don't need replaced at any sort of regular interval and you may be doing yourself harm if you're saying things like oh, i just put wheel bearings in it every time i put tires on it and what that does is wear out the part of the wheel that holds the, the bearing. And a lot of guys will put cheap alternative bearings in there. So they take the high quality OEM bearing that has no problems, pound it out and put a cheap made in, you know, some foreign country uh, piece of crap. And, uh, and, um, and which is obviously a disservice, you know, so. Uh, and I really don't ever see the front bearings go bad, only one or two in my career, whereas the right-hand side rear bearing this is a pretty regular occurrence, and you'll, of course, hear it uh, in advance and wonder why the bike feels weird, it feels all squirmy in the rear, and then when you spin it, you'll, you'll be able to feel the crunchiness, and you can, there'll be some movement in there, but that's not the case with this bike, everything's tight, um, I don't have any worries, so we'll uh, go to the brakes. I'm gonna, it is common for the rear rotor to wear out on these big touring bikes. Uh, and what I mean by wear out is the floating rotor, these pins will wear out and it'll have a distinct clunk when you hold the tire steady and rock the uh, rotor back and forth. Uh, this one's tight and it's good, but sometimes you get one and go tink, 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 and you can <laughs> rock that uh, considerably and it's making a considerable noise and then it needs replaced and um, that's a specialty rotor for victory there's no aftermarket solution on the rear or on the rear one although they do make this rotor for the it's the same for the indians so um right now we're putting the uh, indian uh, i guess we'll call it a polaris rotor at that point 
So uh, the rotor, I've, I've seen that be a problem. Uh, and then we'll move on to the brakes. Uh, same thing. I'll look at the, uh, the little wear bar uh, cut in the pad. And these are 50%. I don't have any worries with this. They'll continue on for another couple 10,000 mile segments. And then the um, caliper does slide on a couple of pins. And the pins can either get dried out or the little rubber boots can get kind of moved over and, and expose the pins to the elements and uh, or the pin you know so stuff can happen to those two pins and so I kind of rock it there should be a small amount of movement that's normal I'm gonna look at the uh, the rubber boots make sure they're good and clean and tight and on there um, tire on this one's good but if I it had to take it apart. Well, I guess you do have to take it apart for that link. A lot of times I'll go through after 30, 40, 50,000 miles and grease those pins, take take this, take the wheel out, uh, and then take the caliper apart from the mount and grease those pins. And that's not a bad idea because sometimes they do lock up after 50, 60, 70, 80,000 miles. It, it's just like a car. The car, A car can do the same thing. And uh, so that's something to check out. I don't have any worries about this one. It looks clean. The, you know, the, the rubber's all good. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy with that. No problem. Um, I'll just kind of scope out the belt too. To kind of a, uh, well, it is a great time to make a mental note of uh, a spot on the belt and just spin it through and make sure there's no rocks that are embedded in the belt and, or have damaged it in any way. Um, it's this is not the bike being in the air is not a way to test belt tension so don't worry about the tension we're just looking at the condition of the belt and then you can kind of shine back up in here and see if there's any leaks coming from the uh, front pulley or anything weird a bunch of rust is a bad indication too or a bunch of oil <laughs> neither of which is going on here and then, you know, of course, I'm looking at the tire, and this one's good. Uh, replace it as needed. But that's that's it for the rear. Uh, check out the suspension, brakes, the pins, you know, the, uh, the tire and the wheel and the pulley and the belt, and just kind of give it a common sense look over with your light. And then we can move on to uh, more of the engine kind of uh, stuff and see what we got up top. Okay, the next area that I want to look at is the battery. And what a great time to check the battery when it's up in the air. Got a little hand tool because it's kind of hard to get the tool up in here and to take out those four little uh, four millimeter Allens and then kind of rock it, cock it to the side to pop the grill out. You had some sort of aftermarket wire here that was zip tied to it. And then I'm going to take a little wrench to the terminals and make sure that they are tight because it is common for the terminals to loosen up and exceedingly common. And when the terminal is loose, it can create all kinds of issues, the least of which is it stalling at stoplights and running poorly. But if it got really bad, we could get some arcing and melt the battery and burn the bike to the ground. So, <laughs> great time to check the overall condition of the battery and, uh, and the terminals. Sometimes if I'm seeing a little bit of uh, battery uh, corrosion, I just take it all apart and uh, clean all the corrosion up and, uh, and put it back together, put some corrosion spray on there. This battery looks good. Uh, it looks nice and, and new-ish and um, you tighten down the terminals and away we go. Um, just make sure there's no weird uh, wiring. This one's coming pretty close to the exhaust here. I might just zip tie this to the other side away from the exhaust and uh, make it easier to get the grill out for further maintenance down the road and in years uh, to come. Uh, but yeah, this should not be skipped. Do this at least once a year. 
uh, to save yourself that, <laughs> that downtime of being stranded by the side of the road for a half a turn on a battery terminal. So, uh, yeah, good advice there. <clears throat> Okay, the next step is taking off the tank. Uh, if you got a vision, you don't have to worry about this because you don't have a removable fuel tank. But for the rest of us, um, the tank coming off is going to be part of the routine maintenance. And I have a lot of people say, oh, I've been online and I am scared to death of removing the tank because I'm going to break off the fuel pump nipple that's under there because that's all I read about online. And I have never had a problem and it's more about knowing how the whole system works in advance uh, and, uh, and having that good knowledge base before you dive in so that you don't break the nipple off. Um, so let's take a look. So the fuel pump is up in the tank. Uh, the filters inside the tank and uh, this is bolted to the tank and this is what you would see on the underside and this is the nipple that they're talking about the output nipple and there's two of them there's this is a new style one which I believe is 11 millimeters and then the old style one was like eight or nine millimeters and uh, they did have the older thinner ones people were breaking them off and so they made a version where these are reinforced and so that gives us two fuel lines uh the bigger one and the smaller one uh the bigger one will have uh, purple tabs on it and the smaller one will have green tabs on it and the key to doing this is once we get the tank up we are squeezing the tabs to disengage the fuel line from the pump uh, and it takes sometimes it's got you got to have a good grip to get that off of there and uh, so that you know both of those is even the, the, the uh, green one here you just you squeeze the tabs together to get it off so and then um, so it'll look like that you squeeze the tabs and it pops off so let's check out uh, how the tank removal is going to go on this bike. I have not had the tank off in advance to make the filming any easier. Let's see how much I struggle with it. <laughs> Hopefully none at all. When I'm popping the side covers off, I'm going to make a mental note and to check out these grommets here. Uh, it's super common for these grommets to wear out, get little chunks taken out of them, and, and worst case is you're cover comes flying off. Uh, some people use like a Napa um, thing, you know, like grommet they found at the local parts store. I just order the Victory versions. Um, you know, they're still available at victorymotorcycles.com. Uh, this one looks like it could use a grommet, so I'm going to put that uh, in my notes and when we put it together, put a grommet on there. Another common issue is a bike that's been lowered will uh, break the plastic side cover holder that is bolted to the side here. And this bike is no different. Let me bring the camera around. So what happens if a bike is lowered is that the suspension right here can come in contact with the uh, this cover or this um, backing piece of plastic that holds the ECM on there and all this wiring and this one is broken so it does that which it should not be able to do and uh, you know we get another one from Victory or find a used one online that is not broken or oh let me pop the seat off here and sometimes it can kind of be jury rigged but um yeah that's a, a common issue here let's back off and all right the joke i used to make back in the day was it was so common for these seat bolts to be stripped that if we found one that wasn't stripped, you'd be like, oh, some 
the mechanic at the dealership forgot to strip these bolts out. That's part of the pre-delivery inspection is to, you know, run the bolts in sideways on a brand new bike. That way, for the rest of the bike, the guy's going to struggle with it. <laughs> oh, let's see. So this uh, ground strap here, this is an anti-static ground strap for the tank so it, we don't generate any sparks because uh, the tank's got rubber isolators and it's full of fuel. And so this is a terrible ground for any sort of aftermarket wiring. And I see this be a problem. Uh, a lot of people would wire the ground to their fuel controller here and then have the bike run weird because it's not an adequate ground. It, uh, so if you're looking for a ground for some aftermarket wiring, there's a factory ground into the frame right here about eight inches away. That's a way better ground. Okay, another tip is sometimes the fuel line, well, here, let me back off. Uh, there's a couple of bushings in here, and um, hold on, let me get the vent line undone and the overflow. Uh, these two tubes are, one's an, a vent and one's the overflow for if you overfill the tank. So you just pop those off there. And then these the bushings that are behind the tank here, they have a tendency to fall into this area right here and we call that the pit of no return and so if your grommet falls in there you could just you have to buy another one there's just no way of getting your fingers down in there into the cruise control area and so you got to be sure to get your fingers and catch those two as they fall out i can see on this bike one's already missing it's probably down in the pit of no return uh the next tip is if the bike uh has a, the bike will have a zip tie here on the fuel line uh, that holds it to the harness and it makes removal of the fuel line a lot easier if you clip that zip tie uh, undo it and then you get a little more room to work I'm just used to the zip tie being there and I can work around it but the key is you just lift the back of the tank and Get your hand up underneath there, uh, do the wire first, that's the electrical wire to the fuel pump, and then give it the best kung fu grip you got. And that's it, it's undone. Now we slide the tank out and up and get it out of here. I think what people are doing when they're snapping those nipples off is they're wrestling with it and moving the tank around and um, you just gotta... <laughs> know that it's a little bit fragile. This is actually the old style, uh, thinner version. But then uh, when you're pulling it off, make sure you don't rake it up against the controls. This one's got aftermarket bars on it. Um, so the controls are farther away, but sometimes you can, like this cruise control switch will dig in and <laughs> gouge the top of your tank. So watch out for that. And that is it. Now that I got the tank off, this is a great opportunity to look at all the engine stuff, air filters, spark plugs, exhaust, cables. Uh, so let me rearrange the camera and we'll take a closer look. All right, let's start with the air filter. What you're gonna find up here is it could be the stock paper air filter which is not cleanable could have this victory accessory catalog cleanable air filter which I would not describe as a performance air filter I would just describe it as cleanable where you remove these two bolts and these three and pop it out of there and rinse it out with soap and water and re-oil it and put it back in 
Um, nothing wrong with that, and nothing wrong with the paper one. But you may also find that you want or have a Lloyd's aftermarket filter, which is the one and only aftermarket air filter for a cross country, and those are also cleanable. Um, a important step is to take the filter out, of course, to clean it. But then let's see if we can see way down in there. That's a popular spot for mice down in that crevasse <laughs> in front of the air filter. And uh, I see that a lot. Uh, or a rodent will fill that full of grain or a mouse will put his nest in there. I've seen it where the mouse will chew through the air filter uh, or the mouse or the nest will get sucked into the engine. And, you know, a guy's too scared to take his tank off to, because he's going to break the nipple and, and then he ingests a mouse <laughs> into his engine. So definitely something to be paying attention to there. Uh, also, when you take that filter out, get your shop back. And a lot of times rocks uh, uh, and road sand will settle in the bottom there and you want to clean out the air, uh, the bottom of the air box where the, the uh, filter seals to the air box. I mean, the air box is the frame. Uh, but yeah, take that out, clean it, vacuum out anything you find in there. We want that spick and span. And then since we're here, we're going to pop off the spark plug boots and look at the spark plugs. I use a 45 um, pliers and kind of pry up and pop that boot out. Uh, that's my trick to getting those out. I've already pre-loosened these. I recommend the OEM spark plug. And these, so this is not a time to say, ooh, it's running ridge or it's running lean because looking at the spark plug is not a good way to, uh, to do that. Um, what we're looking for is, is wear. So this one is uh, all dirty. And that's because it's winter and it's not been allowed to warm up fully and burn off a lot of these deposits. And how a guy can get messed up is say, oh my gosh, it's dark. This thing's running rich. We need to do X, Y, and Z to it. And uh, now this is normal. And, you know, once the bike comes up to temp, it should burn that off and should be a nice normal color. But really, I'm looking at the electrode. Um, and, well, I'm looking for anything weird. I'm not really trying to diagnose the color to, um, you know, diagnose air fuel ratios. I'm looking at the condition of the plug and making sure that it's, uh, the electrode's not worn. Honestly, these will go, uh, I replace these every 10,000 or so. They're $4 a piece or something. So <laughs> for nine, eight to nine dollars here, we can, um, uh, just throw a new set in. A lot of times the, they will rust. The outer body will rust because water is pooling in, uh, in these uh, heads here and rusting out the spark plug, in which case you want to replace a rusted out spark plug and use the OEM plug, uh, please. <laughs> so, spark plugs there, air filter. I'm just kind of looking around, making sure there's no weird oil leaks or whatnot. Um, this one has got oxygen sensors that are still plugged in and that's fine. No problem there. That's the way they should be. Um, let me pop off a couple of these cheese wedges and we'll take our light to the inside and see what there is to see. The next thing we'll be looking at is the idle air valve hoses. The idle air valve hoses is this whole setup here that is inside the V of the engine. You can see this is this tube here and this tube here and then this is the center tube. So this tube draws clean air from the air box into the IAC motor on the other side behind the cheese wedge and then it sends air uh, up into the throttle body to control the idle and uh, for emissions purposes. Um, if you want a cleaner look, you could technically take the coil off, but me, I just get my pen light up in there and look at all the rubber ends and make sure they're not cracked like this one is. Let's see. Focus. There we go. You can see all the cracking. Eventually these will get holes in them and leak air cause it to run poorly. So 
Very important, super common. Some people try to jury rig these with um, stuff they found at Napa or whatever with mixed results. You can still buy this from Victory at VictoryMotorcycles.com. It's about $55 for the set, which uh, might seem exorbitant until you consider all the time you've wasted going back and forth trying to find just the right set of rubbers and uh, time is money in my opinion. Uh, so uh, we're gonna scope that out. You know, these cheese wedge covers, they just pop right off with some clips. Uh, I'll look at, go to the other side and, and shine down on it. Quite easy with the fuel tank off. And then um, I'm just looking at the uh, rest of the condition of everything, making sure there's nothing obvious, sticks or twigs or leaves or mouse nests or anything up in here. Um, another common thing is the throttle body boots. I don't have problems with the throttle body boots on these model years of bike. The 08s had a bad batch, and then they fixed that in 09 and beyond, and I have never in my career seen one get all cracked and worn out, as opposed to older model victories, stuff created in 2007 and older, where it's very common for the rubber to break down and them to need replaced. So a good way to get, get in trouble with this bike is to say, oh, geez, you know, I know they have throttle body uh, boot issues because you're thinking about the older bikes. And I'm going to get an aftermarket boot and attempt to put it on there, which the aftermarket boot I don't recommend because it creates more issues than it solves. One, you didn't need it. And then two, in the installation process, you mess something up and it's leaking and leaking air or it's running poorly now. And so I gave it a cursory glance, but I've never really had to replace one. So... <laughs> Uh, that's just part of the due diligence and um, another thing that I'm just checking to make sure no weird wires are in the way here. The throttle body linkage is over here. I want to make sure there's no wires hanging over it. But uh, that uh, that's a big, big component right there. Uh, another thing to look out for when we're talking about hoses uh, is the crankcase vent. The crankcase vents, it's excess pressure up this line and into the air box. It's pretty common for this 45 degree end to split and then it to be puking oil mist out of there and running down and you think you've got an oil leak when in fact it's just this little 45 here is split and that's something you can just go to Napa and get a freaking 45 <laughs> that, that fits because there's really nothing too fancy about that. Uh, another thing is if the bike is over full in oil, it'll push the excess oil vapor up into the air box and then it's going to drip down onto your engine. And a lot of times you'll see oil way up in here and it's not a leak per se, it's just excess crankcase pressure has put a bunch of oil in your air box and now it's dripping down onto your engine. A good indication will be is that there'll be oil on the top of the coil here. Sorry, I'm a poet and I don't even know it. Um, uh, so if there's no oil on the coil, <laughs> then uh, uh, we can continue on. So the airbox, oil in the airbox thing, it's common, it's unfortunate, not a lot that can be done about it because you really got to take it all apart to clean it all out if it comes to that. It's just an annoyance. Um, and then, you know, I'm just kind of looking uh, for any other weird things, uh, nothing springing out, no weird oil leaks or anything to, to find. Uh, let's see, I want to move down to this shifter since we're, oh my gosh, since we're over here. So the shifter, this is a common issue, uh, where a person thinks that the slop is abnormal and the slop is not abnormal. It's supposed to be built in there and how people get into trouble is they go, oh my gosh, look at all that slop. It's this bushing here needs replaced. And then they see that there's aftermarket bushings. The problem with the aftermarket bushings is they're too tight and it takes all that slop out and then the shifters start locking up and you have shifting problems. The slop is normal. It keeps you from accidentally engaging the transmission with your foot resting up against it. You inadvertently rest your foot up against it and you're burning up a shift fork because it's engaging the whole system. So a certain amount of slop is normal. You know, after 50, 60, 70, 80,000 miles, maybe the stock bushings will in fact wear out. 
or uh, these hind joints will wear out um, or get locked up or something. So you do want to look at this stuff, but don't shake this around and go, oh my gosh, it's terrible, and start trying to fix something that's completely normal and needed. Uh, I'd say about every 10 days or about every two weeks or so, some guy calls me, he's got a shifting problem. And eventually I have to suss out that he just put those new bushings in there. And gosh, it, why does it shift worse after I put bushings in there? <laughs> so that's a good tip there. And since we're down here, I'm going to look at the, the clutch cable end where it meets the engine. Uh, this one, the sheath is a little kind of messed up here. I'm not too worried about it. But a lot of times these will get sticky after 30 or 40 or 50,000 miles. And the, the cable itself will be fine, but it's just... It's hard to work and then I just recommend replacing the cable. Barnett makes an aftermarket one which is adequate or you can still get the stock cable. I have another video that details how to make sure that's adjusted properly. Uh, it is adjusted properly uh, so that looks good. Uh, and yeah that, that's really it for the engine. I mean you check the spark plugs, you change the engine oil and filter, the air filter, the idle air valve hoses, and that's it. And then since I'm here, I just kind of looking at the shifter system and the clutch cable here, and that's all good. So, um, I mean, we're nearing the end of the list here. Let's uh, let's look at the bars next since I hit on the cables and, and such. Uh, let me move the camera up to the bars and show you what to look for up there. I apologize. The camera was set a little weird on the last cut there, so I was looking down at this end of the clutch cable and remember I said the sheath was a little messed up but that's okay it's not going to affect anything and then I push in on the arm and I pull out on the cable and that's a pretty good adjustment I'm happy with that no big deal I am going to take that apart and clean and grease it and then uh, let's go around to this end here I'm also going to take the lever out by removing the little nut here on the bottom and taking that shaft out and cleaning all the end of the clutch cable and everything in here. I'm uh, going to wipe all that down and add new grease to it and assess the cable condition. Uh, and so that is the clutch cable, both ends. You're going to inspect them clean them, lube them. On the other side, I kind of mentioned the throttle cables here. So when you work the throttle, it's doing that. And I see a lot of folks have some stuff dangling here where it can get caught in all these linkages. Um, so we want to address that should it appear. Uh, no real reason to grease or lube anything here. Same with the cables. If they eventually get worn out, then we just replace them. I don't spend a lot of time. Uh, a lot of times the lube will set in a cable and create some stickiness. Um, now here's the adjustment for the throttle uh, itself and make sure that the adjuster is that way. A lot of times people have the adjuster that way <laughs> and which is the wrong direction uh, and so we just want a little bit of uh, looseness there. I'm just going to run it through and make sure there's no catches or it doesn't feel sticky or um, you know just anything that feels abnormal about that and if it were abnormal I would pop this uh, switch housing open and, and check the end of those cables and replace as needed. Uh, since we're over here, it's a good time to talk about brake fluid. Um, you know, the rear is so easy to see here. Uh, excuse me. Well, we can see that it's in the proper zone, and yeah, it's. Uh, I've seen blacker oil, but if you want to be really diligent, uh, we can replace the, uh, the uh, brake fluid. And that's not a bad idea. Same with the top here. Uh, we can uh, pop that off and replace the fluid and wipe out the reservoir every so often, every 30,000 or so. Same thing, we want to take the pivot out. You know, it's got the nut on the bottom for the brake lever. Take the brake lever pivot out, clean and grease all of that stuff. Uh, 
And that's uh, that's it for the top end. All right, simple as that. There was really nothing uh, especially hard about that. Nothing magical <laughs> in uh, just taking a light and looking at your suspension and brakes and tires and wheels and popping a tank off and cleaning out your airbox and your filter and looking at the spark plugs and the hoses and checking the shift linkage and you know suspension and and that's it uh, put it all together and enjoy the season do this once a year and uh, really we should never need to see each other <laughs> happy wrenching message me if you need anything and